Welcome to, now this is Armour Vietnam, so you just know, if you want to leave and you think the fellow's in line, okay, Armour Vietnam. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Jim Mesko, and for those of you that are of the younger crowd, this is a slideshow. Still has got a couple. Yeah, that's fine. We'll start in 1945. When the French came back in, they used actually some Japanese armor, and you can see here several Japanese tanks. Type 95s, Type 89s, because uh, at the time they did not have any. Eventually, they're going to bring over uh, their armor, the U.S. armor. So it, it gives you some interesting modeling areas. One of the problems that we will later inherit when we go into Vietnam is that the French were not liked by the Vietnamese for obvious <coughs> obvious reasons. When they came in. They were using a lot of equipment that they had gotten during World War II, and they were adorned with the U.S. Star, which in the minds of the Vietnamese meant the United States was supporting the French, so they were as bad as the French were. And even when we gave them newer equipment, there would sometimes be U.S. Stars on them. Uh, you'll see here the uh, Free France insignia there on the side of the tank. So this is obviously one that was used in World War II. Notice the variety of headgears here. You have the steel pots, you have the sun helmet here, you have the tanker's helmet. Um, so there's a lot, if you're in the modeling of armor in this period of time, that you can, uh, you know, snatch up your vehicles. <coughs> of course, if you're an IPMS, you can only put two, you can only put two figures on a tank. Uh, of course, you lose rules, so you kind of lose out on that. But uh, there's, just, there's just so much scope there for doing neat stuff with the vehicles. This to me is, is uh, and I love this picture. Uh, it shows what the French had to contend with. Uh, the Viet Minh at that time, not the name Viet Minh rather than Viet Cong, which we would later coin the term for, uh, would blow up bridges and stuff because the French were basically a mechanical army. And so they'd go off by the roads. And so the Viet Minh uh, learned to destroy bridges. Uh, they would do stuff to the road that would make it harder for the French convoys or slow them down for ambushes. And this is one of the French uh, M5s. I think it's an M5A1, yeah. And uh, again, this decal sheet is out. Bison has this decal sheet. They have a whole, they, I think they have two decal sheets out on French armor. This is one of them right here. Again, the French prevents the city of the name on the side. Uh, extra tread and stuff. The Vietnamese pool we have here. Uh, you look here at the French here on the side that are watching it. You have the different headgears, the uh, boonie caps, the, the tropical sun hat. Uh, so if you're doing something with Vietnam armor, there's a host of things you can do with it to dress it up and make it much more interesting. Now one of the problems that the French faced with being mechanized was they were obviously on the roads. As you see here, the roads uh, basically are in many cases just basically a dirt path. In the summertime, they were they were dry but dusty. In the in the rainy season, the monsoons, they would be almost impassable at times. Also, notice how close the foliage is to the side. Very easy to uh, when a convoy is coming through to surprise them. No wrong numbers. Uh, well concealed uh, Viet Minh would be in there and could devastate a convoy in a very short period of time. Uh, this also is one of the sheets, uh, one of the decal sheets, I believe. Uh, and you have the, the regimental crest here. This particular M8 is being used as like a point guard uh, as the convoy goes by. And a lot of times the French would do that. They would send a vehicle out. Uh, it, would, it would be the point to anchor on. The convoy would move from point to point, which is good if you're in the convoy. But if you don't want to set out to be on the point and, and just sit in there static, it makes you, you, you become a much easier target. And you had to have 360 degrees all around. Notice these guys were looking one way. It would be very easy for a Viet Minh to walk up, you know, get, creep up on the jungle, hit him with bazooka, recoilless, hand grenades, things like that. So. The Sherman was used a little bit over there. Uh, it wasn't that well liked because of its weight. Uh, but in the early days, they did use Sherman. Uh, again, here's a good example of the various headgear you can do if you want to dress it up. The seats there on the back. Uh, a scope for all sorts of, you know, adding stuff there. Uh, 
the, there's a French magazine now called GB, GBM that has a lot, did a whole section on French armor uh, in Indochina. And the, the, the stuff that the French used literally almost everything that we had during World War II over there. <coughs> uh, there's also a, a persistent rumor that the French used the Panther and the SDKF 251. I've seen a picture of a 251 over there in Indochina markings. I've never seen a picture of a Panther. Uh, rumors persist that these were used up in the northern provinces when the communists took over China and they were afraid they might come across the border with JS2. But there's never, to my knowledge, been a picture of, of a Panther over there. And you think about how the Panther overheated, for it to be sent to Indochina would be like a disaster. So we'll come back and touch on what they did bring over during that time frame a little later on. A Bren gun carrier and mounting a, appears to be, I think, a British machine gun. I'm not real up on machine guns. I think that's a British machine gun. And now you're seeing, because of the danger of the enemy in the foliage, in the you know, terrain close to the river or the roadside, that they're putting a frame over. And this frame is going to serve a twofold purpose. There's probably, and you can't see it, there's probably a screen here. So that'll serve as an anti grenade screen. Later, they will also put tarps on it on some of them, to act as protection against the sun. And, and by the way, is there any Vietnam veterans here? Okay. So you're all younger. Okay. Well, don't laugh, because the, uh, the reason we're having this show is because the end of the war in Vietnam was 40 years ago. I was there in 1972, and that was 43 years ago, so do the math. I'm 66. So, yeah, you guys are younger. Anybody, is anybody older than 66 or just out of curiosity? Okay. So, I don't feel, I, I, I don't feel too old. Oh, thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. <laughs> But uh, you know, it was a long time ago. I, I think 43 years since I was since I was there. It's like that's almost a lifetime. Uh, Bernard Armored Car, and uh, if you look on the table out there, you will see one of these as a, a model. I'm not going to mention who did it. Uh, hint, hint, hint. But this is an, an ADV asthma kit, which is a combination resin and metal. And it was one of the most difficult builds I've ever had. Uh, and I, I don't mean that <coughs> nastily in the sense that it, the kit went together. But when you're mixing resin and uh, photo etch, and like the entire top deck is photo etch, uh, where the turret is. Uh, turret's beautifully done, the interior is very nice. I had to resin cast some of the extra machine gun uh, uh, magazine. I, it was a challenging kit, but one since I, I really like this period, and I think it's these, it maybe even these markings. It was just a, a kit that I wanted out of my collection. So it's one of those kits that you work on and you like. If you don't have an interest in French armor, don't buy this kit, okay? Because it's it will try you. And uh, I want to try another one, but it's got a complete interior uh, and uh, just you know, interesting model. But these were used usually in the lesser sections of the war. Like this is probably in Laos or Cambodia or southern Vietnam. This was not used against the first line troops up north. For those of you not familiar with the Panhard 178, it was a French armored car that was designed prior to World War II. It was one of the best armored cars at that time. A 25 millimeter cannon, this has a 47 in it. But the Germans captured an awful lot of them and they liked to use them. They used them a lot in the Russian front for inter internal security. And DML has a kit out of it. Uh, ADV. ADV Azimuth has a plastic kit out. Oh no, Albi had a plastic kit out. And it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice, simple kit. Steve Logan just did a build of it in uh, military modeling a couple of months ago. Uh, older kit, but if you, if you like that period of time, it, it, it's very easy to update and make, and make into a nice model. I think Albi has like all the variants. You know. We had DML, the, 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 the DML variants, like the German variants, they, they made that off the Albi kit. And they had like the command vehicle, they had the one around the railroad truck. Uh, the Albi one was a French one. Uh, I don't think they did the 47 of them, like you saw here, that was the ADV asthma kit. Uh, and I think, I think ADV has that turret separately. It's not much different to add to the kit. It's a, a simple armor car to do. And uh, it's some interesting armor, interesting color scheme. And hopefully there'll be another company that comes out and 
brings that in, in uh, a number of newer versions. Here we have a uh, British, I want to say Morris armored car? Humber. Humber, okay. Uh, British vehicles are not, is that my friend from Birmingham there? Or? No, no, oh, no, Okay, Humber oh, Scandi. Uh, the, uh, you see the machine gun turret here? And then I'm assuming this is probably, since it's a, a convoy, probably an M3 scout car. But you see here the distinct French machine gun uh, magazine. This is what I had to cast for the uh, Pinard gun kit. Uh, kind of gives you that flair for the, the, the <coughs> French country at that time. But here they are again, guarding the bridge as the convoy goes past. And they got a lot of, of equipment from the British uh, you know, at that time. We'll see some more of it in a minute. And there's an example. Uh, and you see the guy here sweeping the road for mines. That's one of the things they usually do every morning. Uh, they go out and they sweep the road for mines. Again, look how close the foliage is to the side of the road. And uh, very easy for an ambush to <coughs> be set and to, to catch a group unaware. Uh, one of the things you're going to notice about French armor, especially in the later stages, not so much when the early stuff went over. As you will see a black rectangular here. It will have the French tricolor here, it will have IC, and then it will have the code number for the vehicle, the show number for the vehicle. And that is very common on most vehicles that you're going to see for the French period over there. Uh, here's an example. This is probably again in Laos or Cambodia, M3 scout car. Uh, you've got the frame overhead. I'm going to assume, from the way that the foliage is hanging, there's not a screen there. So they're using the foliage, probably not so much for camouflage, more to keep the sun out, and also the way to hopefully deflect any grenades that came in. But again, this is one of those, you know, kind of neat vehicle, uh, neat period vehicle, period photos for that time with these particular types of vehicles. Now what the French did, we would do this later on with our gun trucks, but they would take some of the trucks and they would up armor them. And you can see here the uh, armor added to the side of the truck. Uh, the screen here now is a little more, com more complex and you have the canvas there that helps keep out the sun, the rain, and the grenades. At least hopefully it keeps out the grenades. And the IC here is a little bit different. They've taken it and split it in half here. You have the first part of the rectangle with the tricolor and IC, and then you have this, the vehicle number over there. Uh, and they, they interspersed these with their convoys, much like we did ours during, or during the Vietnam War. But, of course, the problem they faced is every truck that they took off to do this was one less vehicle capable of pulling supplies. So it's, you know, half a dozen of one, one half a dozen of another. You, you gain the protection, but you, you lose the ability to carry supplies. Yeah? Is that the trailer behind that one? Back here? Yes. I don't. <laughs> it knows another vehicle. Yeah, it looks like it's a nice truck. I don't think it's a, a trailer. I don't think. Now, eventually, as we, at first, we didn't want to support the French. Because they, actually, Rose Brothers said, I don't want the damn French going back into China. Well, when he died, Truman wasn't too, too sure, but Truman wasn't necessarily in favor of the French going back in. So we didn't give them a lot of support, and we, in, in a lot of ways, uh, viewed it as a colonial war. Well, what happened was, this is all well and good, until 1950, June 1950. And what happened in June 1950? Korean War started. Korean War started. Just before that, China had fallen to the communists. We, quote, lost China. How we could lose China since we didn't own it has always been an interesting bone of contention. But all of a sudden we say, wait a minute, the French are fighting the communists. Oh, they're our, they're our buddies. we got to help them. So there's all of a sudden a huge influx of America, they armor, aircraft, ships, the whole deal. And one of the vehicles that they got was the M8 armored car, which they really liked because it was fast, uh, it had a 37mm cannon on it, and it was perfect uh, to replace some of the older British and French armored cars they had. Now you'll notice on the, the machine gun in the cupola, or on, I'm sorry, cupola, in the ring mount, has a searchlight on it. Uh, you'll also notice that it's negotiating a, a dugout trench in the road. And what the Vietnamese would do, the Vietnamese would do, is they would take and they would oftentimes do, I'll go up here to give you an example, they would take and they would dig trenches across the road like this 
and like this and intersperse them so you'd have them going back and forth like that. So there would be enough room if you had, you know, two lines going across like that for the Vietnamese to be able to walk amongst them or with their ox carts. But for a vehicle, they'd have to really slow down or could not maneuver at all and have to fill these back in. So they spend the whole day filling these back in and then that night, the villagers would come out under Vietnamese control and just start digging them all up again and come out the next day. The same thing was there. So it then had a lot of support or coerced a lot of support from the local population. But you'll also notice the French used, in many cases, a playing card in sequence, much like they did in World War II, for the vehicles uh, that were being used. And Oops. I, I like this picture for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, you've got the guy in the turret looking at his, you know, with his binoculars. You've got the driver looking. You've got the guy next to him saying, hell with this, I'm closing this thing up. And you see him reaching to pull the armor flap over. You've got this guy here, bald as a billiard ball, with no helmet on, pointing like, hey, shoot over that way. And this guy here, so they're probably taking the Viet Minh under fire at a long distance. I don't think they're that close, but this guy's still saying, no, nah, I don't think so. Let me get under here under cover. If anybody's ever been in an M8 armored car, this is a tight vehicle to fit into. I'm not particularly big other than my waistline right now. And when I, when I was sitting and doing one of my books with Father, uh, I was struck with, once that thing is closed up, there's not a whole lot of room in there. So you're not a big guy in there. And invisibility is very, very limited. So they preferred to fight with it as open as possible. If not, they could close it up. But then that restricts the visibility. And again, it's half dozen one, six, six one, half dozen the other. You have better protection, but then your visibility is lower and lets the enemy get any closer. Uh, this is probably in the, in the highlands, or either the highlands or up in the, the mountains, sorry, in northern Vietnam. You, know. you see uh, a half track here with the overhead cover. You've got the PSP plank on the side, and I don't think that was for extra armor. It was probably just in case the vehicle got stuck. But it could also serve as extra armor, but uh, it was probably more designed be taken off if the truck got stuck to help them get out or if the half track got stuck. Uh, but again, look at how close the terrain is over here. And you get the mountains up here. I mean, fighting this type of terrain would not be a lot of fun. You'll also notice each of the vehicles in a row has that tarpaulin over the top, that frame over the top. Uh, so it was a very common modification, especially during the monsoon season and keep the rain off. And uh, if you've ever <coughs> I've been in a monsoon, and I lived there, you know, like I was, I was there for like five or six months in a monsoon. When it rains, it is unbelievable. Uh, has anybody ever lived in an area for a while where, there's, where they have monsoon rains? Yeah. Okay. It is unbelievable when it comes down. I mean, it all of a sudden, it just, the sky opens up. Okay. Uh, Sometimes, and depending on the unit, you might have an identification number on the back end of it, in this case, the, the M5. <coughs> I want to say this is a French form legal unit, but I'm not going to go on a line and say, uh, I don't know, them and say that. Again, here's the half track with the frame here. You have the PSP planking again, probably more to extract it from the mud than use for protection. Now, Remember when I mentioned the, they were afraid the JS-2, the Chinese might send JS-2s across the border? What they did was they brought over M36s with an 9mm gun as a protection against this possibility. And these were the, the M36s which had the armor polo on the top where it could close up, so literally it was almost like a, a, a light tank turret. And they mounted machine guns on it because, again, look at the foliage, how close it is. It was very easy for Viet Minh to be there with a hand grenade or a mobile cocktail. So um, they, they need to be there you know, protection against us. And also, since the M36 does not have a whole amount of machine gun, they would need machine guns. They might mine two or three of them up there for protection against the in, in close in fighting like this. Uh, eventually, obviously, the Chinese do not intervene. They don't need to. And these are used basically for uh, support of the ground forces. Here's one by, by a convoy coming up the side of a rice paddy. 
Uh, and a lot of times victims would be given names, either uh, based on French battles, French towns, would depend on the unit. Uh, and all the vehicles a lot of times in the same, in the same section would be given a, a vehicle name beginning with the same letter. So if it, let's say it was B, they might have, you know, every name began with the letter B and then some you know, French town in B or French general name in B. Now, this is a very interesting picture for a couple of reasons. Number one, it shows an M36 here. But look at this vehicle back here. <coughs> Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that is? M32. Close. Mm -hmm. M31. Okay. But you can see the side where the 30, uh, 35 has been pumped. And there's an interesting little story about this. Let me pass it on to you. I was working down at Fort Knox, and they have they had, they had this picture. Now imagine this picture, about four times reduced in size, so you can barely see these vehicles. Now I can make out the M36 there, so I thought, well, okay. So I put my magnification lenses on my camera. This is back before digital, and I'm cranking this thing up. And I put I think three or four magnification lenses on, and I finally get this picture, so I get the M36. Lo and behold, when I print it or have it printed, and I look at it, I'm thinking, what the hell is this here in the background? And it's an M31. So this is, you know, just, just by luck, I picked this picture to enlarge and came up with the, you know, uh, this, the M31 here in the background. Now, one of the things that the French I did, yeah. Back to that picture. Okay, hang on just a second. Looking at the front of the uh, M36, yeah. do you think that's where the rumors of the Panther originated? I, it, I mean, it could be. Sort of the gun barrel, yeah, the it, slope. Yeah, it does. It could have. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there were rumors that they were going to send them over. I, I had a French friend or an American friend of mine who had some French pictures of the AMX-13. It was sent over there for trials. Uh, and he said that he, and he had some pictures of Panthers being tested, <coughs> but I don't recall from our conversation if they were over there or not. But yeah, it could be, you know, it's, uh, it's like, you know, when in, in the Battle of Gulls, they took the Panthers and made them look a little like them Yeah. So, okay. it could be. And one of the things I've read, somebody said, well, yeah, there was one of these down up in War Zone D. War Zone C. Well, if the whole premise of this was that they were brought over to fight the Chinese in case they came across the border, you wouldn't have them down in War Zone C or D, mm -hmm. because that's that's a long, far away right. from that area. So I would tend to say if this guy saw he saw something down in War Zone C or D, it was something that looked like this resembled that. But I can't imagine. Even the 36 of being down in war zone C or D because again that was not a major theater of operations when the French were fighting there. So, yeah, and that may be one of those unque unanswerable questions we'll never know about. Kind of like the camouflage B-58s and the three-tone scheme that supposedly existed. You know, those things that keep us modelers awake at night. Yeah. That make our wives wonder why. <laughs> okay, one of the things the French did, and the French could be very innovative. Uh, well, there's a lot of swampy terrain. Obviously, you don't send tanks and you know things like that out. But they had weasels, so they said, "Hey, let's mount a machine gun on the weasel and send them out after the Vietnam." And at first, these things are clanking across the uh, paddies and stuff and chase the Vietnam down. And then the Vietnam realized something: these things weren't very well armored, and they started shooting back. And pretty soon, there's a lot of weasel rusting out in the paddy, a lot of dead French in them. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the French start to evolve these tactics. Uh, has anybody ever ridden in a weasel? Okay. You know what a hell of a bumpy ride this thing is, right, Steve? Yes. Not much suspension. Uh, yeah. In fact, Steve back here, he and I and his wife were in one one time. One of our our amp guy uh, has one. <laughs> My ear is still kind of ringing from where she was screaming. She did not enjoy that trip. But yeah, these things, I'm not sure how good a fire support they would be trying to chase them down, because they're bouncing all over the place. 
But as a sanctuary, then they can get they can get you out of the patties and, and bring weaponry to bear against the Viet Minh. So the French start to they start to evolve their tactics, and these are operating in larger groups. And now they're a little more respectful of the enemy. Let me go back on that one for a second too. You'll notice here again that IC, the French license up here in the front, and then the insignia here. Uh, the French, as the war becomes more of an, I don't want to say an ongoing thing, but just a normal thing. They started you know, marking vehicles uh, one at a time. And here we have them fighting in rice paddy someplace. Now what the French do is they start adding LVTs. So in this case, they've taken an LVT-4 uh, and they've added a 40 millimeter gun turret to it. And one of the guys over in France who does uh, M, M models, he's looking for information on the turret itself and the mounting. And he hasn't been able to uncover anything yet, but these were used to go out in support of the crabs, the, uh, or as they call the weasels, like in sections of, I think, six, four or six. So these were better designed to move through the, the mud and the muck and the mire. And you can see, looking at the uh, sponsons there, how much mud that thing's kicked up. Uh, so these gave them an edge in firepower and allowed them to accompany the weasels, crabs, to uh, carry operations. And these became a very effective tool in the, the swamp terrain that the French would operate in. They would also take and use the LBT 84s and these are the unmodified ones that they have the that we had modified after during the Korean War. But they do have the again the shield over the top to keep out the sun and also providing us grenade protection. And these also have the machine guns because they knew that since this didn't have the machine guns the way it should have, uh, they needed to have close in support or close in protection. Now, with the influx of new material also comes a very good tank for the French, the M24. And I like the M24 because it was fast, it was well armed, the 75 millimeter cannon in it, it was well armored, and uh, it could traverse a lot of terrain that previously they hadn't been able to do. Those on turret, the French playing card, the playing, playing card symbol there. These are slowly replacing the M5s in the main theater operation. Uh, you'll still see M5s down uh, in southern Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, where the air operation was not as profound. But these were very well liked by the French, and they eventually airlift 10 of them into the Dien Bien Phu, uh, breaking them apart, and these would be a very critical factor in the defense of the Dien Bien Phu. And one of the questions that's always been raised is, had they had an entire French platoon there instead of just 10 vehicles. He kept them concentrated at the main base rather than putting some of them on Isabella south of the base. That would have been enough to have saved the French uh, from the infantry attacks of the Viet Minh because they were very effective in, in stopping the Viet Minh infantry attacks. And here you have a column of these. These are in the central highland area, I believe, but you can see a column of the uh, M24s there. And again, well liked by the French. Uh, and it was a good vehicle. For, I will later show you some pictures here of ones that uh, were used by the South Vietnamese, and I had a chance to take pictures of some of them myself. They're still being used when I was there in 71 and 72, although not as first line, not as first line defense. Okay, this is one of the French uh, M24s at the Dien Bien Phu. Uh, a gentleman in France I was corresponding with was over there, and he sent me pictures of most of them. I think all but one or two of them are still there in various states. Some of them are worse for wear. This was uh, on one of the French hills. I forget which one, which particular hill, but this, uh, they just cranked it back, took it back, uh, there and put a, a, a on, a, on a display there. But again, these were very instrumental in the defense of DNB and Fu. Jim? Yeah. This was a change in, in the French tactics where they, they started the fire base where they air transported those in and attempt yeah. to hold the area. But they didn't realize we the concentration that was building up around them. Well, what they what happened was back, uh, which I'm trying to think, the airhead in the sand, they did this. 
at the time, it was similar to Dien Bien Phu, except the French, the, the Viet Minh didn't have the artillery. And so they, they started doing this. They would, they, would, they would drop, they would take troops in, and then they would they evacuate them out and say, hey, this is a pretty good concept. We can do this because the, the Viet Minh didn't have artillery support. Add that artillery support, and all of a sudden you have just created a death trap. And at Dien Bien Phu, the French said, hey, you know, not a problem here. If the, if the Viet Minh bring artillery, we'll blast the hell out of it. Well, the Viet Minh kind of called their bluff, and he drilled through the hills and had a very narrow arc to fire down right into the valley. And you know, the French, I mean, there's this big valley here, you can see everything. And they got 105s and pack 75s, and they're sighted through a very narrow aperture. I mean, there, there's hardly anything left. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, they can only move a couple of degrees. But that means they're shooting straight into this area. And they had, uh, I don't know how many they had there. And also, it was during the monsoon season. So napalm would not ignite the brush. You know, cause a lot of smoke for the French. I mean, the French couldn't see into it. They could still see, so it was like the perfect storm against the French. The Dien Bien Phu is a fascinating uh, battle to follow. A uh, great book on it is Hell in a Very Small Place by uh, Bernard Fall. Uh, the Last Valley, uh, there's no one I forget the name of it, but excellent accounts of that. And there were so many near misses that the French could have won. And one of the comments that was made was, a lot of the French colonial troops that had it up, they just up to here and they just said, we're not gonna fight and they surrendered. And they said, if the French had had 10,000 SS there, they'd still be there fighting. <laughs> and or 10,000 US Marines, which was again the <coughs> case on. But the, uh, it's an interesting, you know, melting pot for the entire war at the end of the Empire. And the French also, has anybody seen the movie? It was about 1995, 1998. The French made a movie on the end of the have you seen it? Have you seen that movie that the French did on the the Indian mm -hmm. movie? Mm -hmm. Street without joy or something? No, no, this was an actual movie. It's, you know, it, uh, but it dealt, deals with nice little excerpts on uh, YouTube, and it really looks very good. I mean, but the thing is, it was never done in English, and it's in the French DVD, which does, is not compatible with our DVDs. It's like I get a copy of it. It really looks good. Okay. Um, I'm not sure Picasso was over there, but if he had been, he would have had this. But here's an M3 that is a little worse for wear. I think this was in Cambodia. And again, you see the kind of weird camouflage scheme there. Um, I don't know the history behind this, but it was just one of those interesting pictures that you know have there. Excuse me. But this was, like I said, I'm pretty sure in Cambodia. Now, um, the Vietnamese, when it was Vietnam was constituted as, as South Vietnam, they inherited vehicles. They took vehicles like this and modified it. Um, somebody help me out the name. I'm forgetting to draw a blank. Otter? Otter. The one uh, But they took, they took these and they modified them, had them armored. Uh, it's a new kit that's out by LG, whoever. Uh, and I'm waiting for this particular version. Well, I saw some of these when I was over there. Uh, they were scrapped by that point. But they make for an interesting vehicle. Uh, they would mount machine guns on them. Um, but these were like second line troops. Uh, these were not the, the main arm, the main units of the arm. Arm. These were all like regional forces. But again, just you know, one of those interesting vehicles that you find that you can model from them. And here's one being worked on. <coughs> A little different than all before. And and notice how OSHA would really love how they got them jacked up there. <laughs> hey, Nguyen, you climb under and crawl under that vehicle there. <laughs> uh, it's all, you know. And it was interesting because like I, like I said, I worked with the Vietnamese for, for a year. And the Vietnamese were very interesting people. Uh, some of them were, I mean, just like anybody, some of them were really nice, some of them were not so nice. But most of the ones we worked with were just friendly, easy going people. They didn't want to have to be by a wall anymore than we did. But uh, you know, they, they were they, they could be just as ingenious as anybody and and, and hardworking, dedicated, or they could be just as lazy and sloppy as anybody too. But the one thing if you uh, a Vietnam veteran will always can always say this about the Vietnamese. They would always say to you, hey, G.I., you have Salem? And they love Salem. They love that menthol. Oh, geez. So I, I ended up carrying back. The Salem would be just a, you know, 
I ran across. Hey, Jay, you want to? Yeah. Have, 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 have a sale. Get a friend for life. These were uh, British designed wicker uh, armored trains. They had like three of them. And I've never found out whatever happened. They probably got blown to hell and back on the railroads. Because again, the railroads provided the BMW with a target. And these were designed to provide protection. And again, when you've got something like this and you're rumbling down a track and they get a bazooka and they blow the tread, uh, it's not a real longevity for life when you're in the crew here. Uh, National Geographic did some very interesting uh, photo articles back in the early days of the Vietnam War. They did a thing on like uh, train rides through war-torn Vietnam. They did a thing on uh, the helicopter war. They, they, they were great color pictures for that time frame. This is before uh, 65, and then gradually, of course, uh, the, the war that's going on and on, the geographics turned against it. But there's some very interesting early National Ge Geographic's uh, photo articles about the Vietnam War, which was very good in terms of reference material. And uh, I don't know what the hell that is. The top slide didn't come through. Okay. That one must not want to show. Okay, here we have. I'm good for time. Uh, <coughs> we've been going for about 40 minutes. If you have M113, these are one of the new vehicles we gave to them, one of the M114s. And these were stationed very close to Saigon many times to provide support for the government. Uh, armored troops became known as coup troops because they, or coup troops, because they would be called in to support the president or the, whoever the ruling regime was. And so if there was a, some sort of revolt going on, a lot of times in the streets of Saigon, you would see these here. This is, uh, these are camouflage, as you can see and probably a purplish brown, green, and maybe some tan in them. Now, the Vietnamese insignia you will see here is on a yellow background. Sometimes they will have the three stripes, uh, the red stripes, which is part of the Vietnamese flag, and then you will have the numbers there in black. M114s were used initially over there. They hated them, uh, although they were perfectly good size for the Vietnamese. They got stuck in the rice paddies, there was mechanical problems. The M113s were much, much better. So these were very, very quickly withdrawn. To my knowledge, when we went in, we did not take any M114s with us. We didn't like it any better than they did. In fact, this was probably one of the worst uh, vehicles on strength in the U.S. Army at that particular period of time. It was not well liked by anybody that know. Very small, very cramped. Uh, you, you couldn't, if you were in the back of it, you had to scrunch over it. And, and sit up straight. Now, fast, uh, but mechanical problems would, would cause this to be withdrawn very quickly from service. Don't ask me what it is. I have no idea. It is some sort of armored car. It was carved together at Tansonut. I have no idea what it is. I have never seen anything on this. Other than the fact somebody sent me this picture, or the number of this picture, I ordered from the government, and it said armored car. <coughs> Not some airport. Uh, eight, I think, 808 uh, transportation unit. It's like, I have no idea what this is. Uh, it's obviously not an M8 because of the four wheels. I don't think it's a prelude. It looks a little bit like a V100, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just let you in because it's, it's unique. Now, the M113 will become one of the main vehicles used by the South Vietnamese Army and our Army, too, when we were over there later on. Uh, at first, they used it as a light tank because they had the 50 caliber machine gun up there. And then in the uh, Battle of An Lac, uh, a very sizable South Vietnamese force had surrounded a uh, main force Viet Cong company uh, in support of a Vietnam a Viet Cong radio station. And so these guys were charging across rice paddy thinking that the, the Viet Cong are going to run at the side of tanks. Well, they got the surprise of their life. They had machine guns dug in, and they started blasting away. And out of the 12 gunners, 11 of them were killed. So they had no armor protection at the time. And eventually, uh, the Viet Cong would draw, in part because the North and South Vietnamese leave them an area that they can withdraw because they don't want to go there and mess with these guys. And basically, the South Vietnamese got the shit kicked out. And that's the nicest way of putting it. And the Viet Cong even had a stamp to commemorate this battle. 
And this is considered the turning point of the war because it's the first time a South Vietnamese unit in strength is unable and is actually defeated by a main force Viet Cong unit. Uh, I think we lost, well, we lost several helicopters shot down. So this is a turning point in the war because all of a sudden it, it shows the incompetence of the South Vietnamese leadership and to a certain degree the troops. Uh, a gentleman, uh, John Paul Line, was an advisor at the time, and he basically went to the press and said, these guys are worthless. And the command in Washington, the command in Saigon, they're full of shit. And Vaughn will very shortly leave the Army. But he will go back, and he was there in 1972, uh, 71, as basically the civilian commanding officer of uh, the Highland area and will save the save highlands from being overrun by the Viet Cong or Viet North, North Vietnamese. And the first time I ran across this guy's name, I was, in, I was going to church, and the, the priest gets up and he says, uh, we had a very tragic thing happen last night. John Paul Bond, John Paul, John Bond, bah, whatever, was killed in a helicopter crash. I'm thinking, who the hell is this guy? So I had never heard of him before. Well, then Neil Sheehan comes up with a book called A Bright Shining Light. And that's John Paul right now. And a very interesting man. Uh, you read about him, and the, the story's fascinating. But uh, he epitomizes all that was good about the American flashers, and also all that was bad about the American flashers. Uh, the plank hanging down on the side there is probably more to extract it rather than for any type of armor protection. But the South Vietnamese will develop ACAB vehicles with the turrets there, and we will use their, actually we learned from them, to develop our ACAB vehicles. Now, the other thing that's not too smart is, what do we got up here in the front from a driver? <laughs> Those aren't water cans, it's like, okay guys, if this thing gets hit, it goes boom, and there's a lot of flaming fuel all over the place. So, but again, you see here the uh, plank on the side here, the uh, costino or the barbed wire there, this right here. Uh, Vietnam, especially 113s, are custom made to have stuff added to them, like these like to add models. <clears throat> now, we get to the American involvement in uh, when the American Expeditionary Forces landed. And it was interesting because the American ambassador in Saigon says, okay, we want our presence to be sort of, you know, muted. You're only bringing in a whole army. How do you kind of mute its presence there? And he didn't want a lot of artillery, a lot of tanks. Well, the Marines come thunder to shore. They got tanks. They got, I mean, they got everything. And the ambassador is about this, and he just goes basically apeshit. It's like, what the hell is going on? And the Marines said, Hey, what's your problem? We're going to fight a war. We're taking our tanks with us. So gradually, they start bringing more tanks in there. This is an interesting picture because notice how close the foliage is to the tank, literally right on top of you. However, I don't think these guys are expecting much because here's a guy sitting there, you know, no shirt on, no helmet. This guy's got just his, you know, tanker uh, helmet on. This guy's here you know, with a flop top, you know, camo hat, with a camera. This guy's kind of walking along, you know, with cigarette in his mouth and no helmet on. So they're probably just doing a sweep, not thinking that the Viet Cong or the Viet Cong are going to be close fire the North Vietnamese. But it gives you an idea of just the type of terrain they're operating in. And this was probably a main thoroughfare at the time. Um, so you can see some of the problems that they faced. And sometimes you ran into mines and look at what it could do. Using the M48s were very easy to, uh, to extract in terms of, you know, not being that damaged, although once in a while they hit a really big mine, it could cause some damage. But they were pretty good at resisting mine damage. I saw an M41, I don't know if I have a picture here later on, a South Vietnamese one, ran over a 250 pound air bomb that had been rigged as a landmine. And it blew the fenders off, the wheels off, paved the bottom, and killed the whole crew. Uh, so the light tanks did not fare as well, especially the Sheridan. That's one of the, the big gripes the Americans have about the Sheridan. Notice the crude markings up here for the, you know, the C-31, C-30, I believe, one. But then here, the Marines always put a crest on the side of the uh, filter box on the side, which would have the, the unit number of the tank battalion. Also notice the, how, how much extra gear is on this thing. And here they are. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Is this a, like a radar direction unit, a radar finding 
a fire control unit or anybody know? GSR, ground surveillance radar. Okay, so it was used to like think of incoming rounds? Well, that and also could detect movement outside okay. the lines yeah, in the evening. Okay, thank you. I, I never, never knew what this was. So they're obviously on a hill and with the tank providing support for this unit here. <coughs> and you'll notice here on this particular tank, you'll see the searchlights fitted. And here you have, and these are not 48s, these are 67s with the flamethrower. You can tell by the larger barrel. And this is probably 67 or 68. You have the extra turret, uh, or the extra tread, worn treads added to the side of the turret there for additional protection. So uh, uh, as you see, uh, by the way, I, gotta, I better be careful before I say anything. Are there any Marines here? Okay, I, I'm glad I didn't make a stupid ass Marine comment. <laughs> of course, everybody in the room, I'll, I'll put on a Marine joke. You all know the Marine Corps is a uh, department of the Navy, right? Oh, yeah. Do you Marines know the, you guys know the reply to that? It's the men's department. <laughs> so, uh, I get a Marine buddy where I saw that around. Yeah, yeah, we're the men's department. So. But if you've, ever, uh, if you've ever been by the side of an Amtrak, these things are huge. And they were designed basically to bring troops ashore. They were not designed to be used as APCs because the fuel is in the bottom. So if you get a landmine, what's going to happen? Poof. And it's instant like, you know, 40 Marines incinerated. So they, they learned this, unfortunately, through trial and error. And so a lot of times you'll see the Marine, when they're on these vehicles, Uh, on top of it, and you'll see sandbag parapets uh, like this, and I mean, and, and, and this is basically a moving house. I mean, these things are huge, and uh, not designed. I mean, they really weren't designed to be used ashore like this. And they get an incredibly small freeboard. I think I had a picture of one in the water. So this was not an ideal vehicle to be used in Vietnam. But again, that's what they had, and that's what they went with. And imagine being a Viet Cong in the trench and see this coming at you. It would be like, oh, geez, million, we're in a lot of trouble. But they would use these for engineer vehicles. They had a, the artillery version with the 105 in it. They would put uh, all sorts of markings on them. I got one that's white and it was used for a Santa Claus sleigh at Christmas time. And again, imagine you're in a trench and this thing's coming at you. It's something like out of a, a science fiction movie. And then here's the artillery version. Um, again, yeah, I mean, you look at this guy here. Assuming this guy here is six foot, that means he'd be up to about here. So these things are at least eight, nine feet high on the side. They are big. And if you ever go to the AFP club, kid, be very careful with it. I did one, in fact, I did one in it was last year's show. It had the, the parapet the, uh, from Holly Fan on it. But, the hull comes in like the top, two sides, and front and back piece. So there's like one, two, three, four, five pieces and, and the bottom. And you really got to take your time, number one, to eliminate the seam and get it to line up right. It's not, once you get it done, it looks great, but you really got to be careful and you have to re-add some of the weld seams too. But it's a neat vehicle. Yeah, and imagine this is a calm river or a calm bit of ocean water they're going through. There's not a whole lot of freeboard there. So, if, if you're riding in this thing and somebody says, surf's up, it's like, close the hatches. And then we go from the huge moving house to the little hunt of it. And uh, if you built the academy kit, you know the problems with the suspensions. Steve Logan had a really good article on this. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Antos, it was a light, mobile anti-tank weapon. It had six 106 recoil rifles on the side. Uh, very little armor, and it carried the, the six guns were loaded, and you had, I think, 12 shells in the back. But to reload it, you had to get out of the vehicle and load it in the open. Not necessarily cool when there's snipers run, so they often had to pull, they'd fire, pull out, mirror the secure, get out and reload it. Uh, had a 30 caliber machine gun on the commander's polo, and the had spotting 50 caliber rifles on the uh, 
um, 105 or 106s, which had the same trajectory as the 106. So they would, you, there's a real nice picture on YouTube of one of these things firing in a way, and you see that you see the arch of the shell, the, the incentive or the uh, tracer going, and then it hits the target, and the next thing you know, boom, and that thing blows up because they fired the, you know, the run on target, and they fired the 106. Now, in, case, in this particular case, you see on the side, they pulled the, either the fenders up or put wood slats there for additional storage. Got sandbags there, extra track for armor. Uh, so, neat, neat little vehicle to make, too, had the academy messed up the suspension. And here they are on patrol. Probably not a major operation because you don't, you don't see any guys carrying extra gear. And probably those jerry cans are filled with water rather than fuel. Because that was one of the big things out there, you needed to have a lot of water. So a lot of times the tanks would carry water for two reasons. Number one, uh, they need the crew themselves needed, but also the company infantry who, you know, basically shielding you. Uh, it kept them hydrated and they would appreciate the fact you have to carry all these your canteens and stuff a lot of times. Also notice here, the, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, if you're seeing this from a distance, what's going to really stand out on this guy right here? White t-shirt. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, the, a lot of the early wounds there were right in this particular area because you imagine where that, that dot triangle is, you can hit there and it's almost probably a death wound. And here it is mounting a uh, searchlight probably from an M48. And you can see the spotting rifles up here. Okay. They were used a lot of times to defend fire bases and also for convoy escort. Although there was an incident <laughs> supposedly where the 106 rounds clicked off and there was a duster in front of them and the duster was toasted, so they said, okay, we're not gonna use you guys, because the circuits were short circuit because of the moisture. They said, okay, we're just gonna use these for convoy escorts. So, but there were some of these up at Quezon, and they could fire the beehive rounds, but if you're familiar with the beehive, it's like a little dart, and these shells could carry several thousand of these things that literally would decimate a human wave attack. Shets. Shets, what'd I say? Darts. Darts. Well, yes, they're, I'm they sorry. Like, they look like they're 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 darts. They look like darts, I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, I'm tired. I must be getting tired. Well, they yeah. used to tack guys up with trees. Oh, yeah, they yeah. They got hit with a the yeah. thing would blow and scatter. And well, we had, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tour guide at our local air museum, and we have some flechettes from World War I, which are probably, oh, about six inches long. Now, you look at these flechettes, and these flechettes are only, oh, maybe inch, inch two inches. Yeah, and the kids are amazed at how big the ones are in World War I, the ones we have in Vietnam. Uh, another one, a big piece of the, the Marines brought in was, was the 80 inch howitzer, the M53s, which is the old runwall kit, which is a cool kit, not very accurate, but a neat kit. And these were used for fire support. Very light, uh, lightly armored turret there. Uh, we, we could use a good 35th scale kit of this out there. And then an 8 inch, and I didn't know, that, I didn't realize the Marines had the 8 inch versions of, the, uh, of this. This is up towards the end of the war. Notice the coloration of the suspension because the, the terrain in Vietnam was very kind of a reddish brown. So if you're doing Vietnam vehicles, uh, especially depending where you're at, uh, it could be redder than even this right here. And there it is, notice the name up on the barrel here. <coughs> now this vehicle has just I think been released by Hobby Fan in resin for like $150, $200. Uh, but they did a whole series of track vehicles. Uh, these basically have, I believe, inflatable rubber tires here. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, is this the Otter? The That's an Otter. Yeah. Oh, okay, Otter. Because there's like two or three different ones they gave their names to. <coughs> and this is the unarmored version. It's a neat looking vehicle. This is actually, I think, up at Dong Ha being unloaded from a Navy landing craft. But here it is being used as, I don't want to say a combat vehicle, but like a supply vehicle and also a recon vehicle. And these were not good for that. Uh, again, like the, the, the crabs, eventually the Marines realized these things are very susceptible to enemy fire and they're, they quit using them. 
Now they have an armored version of it. And here we have it. And this is out now. Again, $150, $200 for the resin. And this was used for a limited while up by the Marines up there. And the name of it escapes me. The other one's got it. This is, anybody knows? Yeah, I've got it in my files back home. I forgot to look at it before. It's not really the same vehicle. Right? No, it's not the same vehicle. Armored, 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 armored. But this is the armored, the yeah. armored variation, not yeah. variation, but the armored version of this, this, this concept. Design M113 train. No, 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 no. This was designed, this was only a uh, vehicle on its own. And then here's another version of it. And it, there's very little out on this. So, again, I, I apologize for not having more specifics on this. But again, these were used for supply. And they would also, and we figured, and they can track through here, we can armor and send out a patrol. It's like, nah, you really can't. Well, that one might be a husky there. Yeah, that might be that. Yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, it's like, these are so obscure, it's hard yep. to find information, and then remember it. Thank you. Now, we'll go to the Army from the Marines, and here's the M48, and again, the Army didn't feel they could use them there, but there were a lot of areas in Vietnam where you actually could use them. Uh, obviously, the, the Mekong Delta, you could, but that's where the Navy River Rain Force came in. But in the Central Highlands, uh, uh, along the coast, a lot of areas where you know, tanks could be used. And here we have one, obviously this crew's been around for a while. You see the extra uh, treads on the side for additional protection, all the extra gear and stuff. And again, our armor knowledge has gradually starts to evolve as the war goes on. This is during Tet or 68. And notice how the barrel uh, muzzle flash has kind of turned a little sideways. These are guys just taking a rest right now before they move on to the Saigon. Now here they are at either the Army base or at Tansanut during Tet. And they're taking a break after having cleared out an area. Notice the, the darker color here, especially on the M113. So you're going to get, most army vehicles have a darker, almost blackish green color to them. Uh, marine armor is going to be more of a, more of a greenish OD. Now one of the things that they had learned, and here again you see a 113 or 113, 148 going down the road. But the fact is once you've gone past there, it doesn't mean it's secure. So here you have a guy covering the rear to make sure that in case of Viet Cong, or an NBA pop up from behind, he's covered. Notice the blue chest there. I don't know what's on the antenna, but I got a feeling it's either women's panties or I don't think it's a bra. I think it's probably women's panties. <laughs> Just, you know, army sense of humor. And then the various gear atoms at the side of it and stuff. But notice on the side of the turret how much dirt is on the side of the turret. So. Here's the M113 that, where that M48 was said this is part of that same set of pictures. Notice the scrapes and scratches on the side of that M113. Probably can crash from the jungle a lot. Okay. Uh, there'll be another side picture, but here's the 113. Notice how much gear is on. That's my gear. Small white stars here. And I have a picture of another slide presentation where when we first looked at it, they had huge white stars on the sides of the vehicle. And these became a verbal gaming point. So eventually they, they started to paint them out, or in the one particular picture I'm thinking of, took army tape and taped it out. You see this you know, rough shaped star covered with tape. This is a vehicle from the other side there. This is in Saigon proper. Behind it you have the M578 recovery crane. And this is the true American A cab with the mm -hmm. turret, the machine gun sh shield in front, and the shields for the gunners in the back. One of the more interesting vehicles was the M56, uh, carried a 9mm cannon on it. This came in with the 173rd Airborne. The only real armor protection is right here. And that, 
it, when you look at that, that is an incredibly small shield. <laughs> and imagine you're out there firing, and this guy, you're the guy standing here, it's like, okay, well, how the hell do I get down here and hide behind the shield? The 90 millimeter had a hell of a back blast, and I've got a picture of showing it going off, but it was also not suited for jungle warfare. Uh, the rounds were carried back here. Uh, there's a plastic kit of this out, the Revell did in 140th scale, which is huge in 140th. Uh, we could use a good vehicle in this, and I don't think there's a resin one out there. But it's just a neat vehicle. But again, it was a concept that wasn't bad for the airborne forces if they're going into an area, but not for use in a uh, jungle warfare like this. Okay, here's one, and uh, moving down the road. And again, you can see that there's not a whole lot of protection other than the gun shield. And then the next one, if I can that, yep, you'll see how all the gear is loaded down there. And uh, tremendous recoil from the 90 millimeter. So, and muzzle blast too. So, interesting vehicle, but again, one of the ones that probably never should have been sent over there. Jim, is that the driver's position with the windshield? Yeah, that's behind the windshield, yeah. Yeah. So, and the windshield, I, I, the windshield is not armor plate of glass as far as I know. So, you're, <laughs> you're driving this thing and you, you, you got Mr. Vietcong Sniper out there, and he's like, guess what? So, uh, it was quickly pulled out. By the way, and not before we talk about this people, the Antos is going back to the Marine ones. Those were eventually pulled out, stripped of the replaced rifles. Suppose that the chassis were driven into some caves, but some of them were given to elements of the 130, 173rd uh, Infantry, or Airborne uh, Brigade. And they were used by the Army for a while. Well, there were the only times the Army used the Antos in active combat, but sort of as, as an ad hoc unit. Now, um, depending on the unit that you were in, you either loved this vehicle or you hated it. If you were in an M113 unit and you inherited it and you were given these vehicles, you loved it because now you had a tank. It was better protected than your M113. If you were in an M48 unit and they said you're getting shared it, it was like, oh shit, literally. Because it didn't have the protection. Uh, and in fact, one of the guys that I know was in 48s and they transferred them to Sheridan's. He said, we hated it. He said, we drive our mind to little vehicle to pieces. If we rode over it in an M48, we'd blow up road and we'd all be okay. If we hit it in this, there's a good chance we'd lose two or three crew members. Uh, it was designed to fire the Chevrolet missile, which was a self combusting shell, uh, but again, it, was, it would take in moisture and not completely uh, clear out the bore, so we put the next shell in and the chance it could cook off. Eventually they're going to add a uh, high-powered uh, air, uh, air canister to clear the barrel out, and this, this vehicle is constantly evolving. One of the things that they did to solve the mine problem was, you can see here bolted onto it, a uh, bottom piece of armor. Uh, the initial vehicles did not have much in the way of storage, so they put racks on the back of it. Uh, the Academy kit, the turret is supposed to be very badly shaped. Uh, but it does have a lot of the Vietnam features, such as the command controls and things like that. The Mai did an ancient vehicle this many, many decades ago, and the Academy kit is better than that, but it still has its problems. Uh, this is one of the first tanks that went into Kuwait, the uh, M551s, uh, because it was an airborne tank. Uh, it was used quite extensively out at the National Training Center as Soviet vehicles they modified, and they, I think they're retiring them all now. In a way, it was a good vehicle. It wasn't really a tank. It was more of a high mobile artillery piece. And if it could sight in on you and, and get the first shot in, you'd keep the, you know, with the strong stay armor out there. But once you, once you shot your water right off the bat, it was not a good vehicle. And it was not a good vehicle for the Vietnam War. It had a I think it had a 152 millimeter, but yeah. I read a book on it and the turret was aluminum. It couldn't even handle gunfire. Yeah, no, it was very, very lightly armored. Uh, that's what I used to fire the beehives out of that. Yeah. And here, and you know, I mean, it, it could be used effectively, but it was not designed for the Vietnam War. It was designed more for the war in, in Europe. But of course, the Army said, oh, let's send it to Vietnam. And, they didn't even really test it. They said the first test <coughs> was had a lot of problems. Here's one moving up. I, I think I don't know if this, I want to say this is Tet. It's more like 71. No, it wouldn't have been 71. It would have been before that. Probably 69 or 70. 
Notice that you have the gap markings here on the sides. Oh, nice awesome. guide on there. And I don't believe this is a camouflage pattern. Had any just dirt and grime? No way, or rust coming down the side. But notice on the back you have the uh, you have Katsina wire, and you also have the screen which you put around the thing to protect against RPG. And here I think it's probably the same vehicle, and with the M113 there with the again the cast and the cab flag here. Again, look how much gears on that too. So if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna do Vietnamese or Vietnam armor, you need to have a ton of stuff to hang on to. We're doing a good time, was I think? Yeah. We're at uh, one hour and ten minutes. Okay. Uh, M557. Uh, notice the variety of markings here. The extra large uh, target. Cab marking there. The Playboy Bunny there. The star, big star there, you know. Okay, great. Nice place to aim at. <coughs> Border carrier version of it. This is kind of a cool scene because it shows how they set up. And you have the base plate still on the side for the mortar. You have the wire set up to help set up RPGs. Uh, the overhead cover here to protect against the sunlight. So this is a, a neat diorama uh, picture. And a lot of these pictures, if you get my, if you can still find my book Armor in Vietnam, a lot of these pictures are in there. And here's a fire, here's a mortar carrier just firing. The Tamaya kit is, I think, the only mortar version of it out there. And not too bad a kit. Uh, you, can, you can make lemonade out of it uh, without too much sugar, but you need to do some work with it. Uh, M108s were used there. I also found that the, the Australian Army used M108s, and they used them, they were camouflaged. So there's some stuff online about this. Here you can see the kill markings of the fire mission on the side. This was not used very much because it was found out that this chassis is basically the same chassis as the M109 was, and the M109 had a 155. So it's like, we're going to send the thing over there, let's put a 155 and use the 155 version rather than a 105. So these are quickly retired. But like I said, the Aussies had them, and uh, they were at least two ton camouflage things. And now here's the, 10, here's the 109. And again, a neat little revetment scene. Um, good vehicle for support. Uh, mobile, some protection. Uh, so it became, you know, one of the mainstays of the uh, mobile artillery. And Bullwinkle. I think this, I think this was being prepped to go home. And of course, this is this this vehicle is launched. You hear this back in the '60s. These things are still in use today, although obviously the newer versions. So that's, you know, a 50-year lifespan for a vehicle. That's not too bad. That is not the shell going on, by the way. That's not the shell going on. That's the motor. But the interesting thing is the shield up here on the you know, side of the commander's mount with the artillery crest on the side. And all my indication, all the research I have, is that this actually was in Vietnam. Uh, the caption with it, the train in the background, that this has this four tone scheme in Vietnam. Um, you know, just, I don't think this was, this took place in Europe. So. But you gotta be careful when you research army pictures. A lot of times you look at something and the caption is totally wrong. And when I first saw that, I thought, well, is this caption right? And it appears to be from all the background information in the, in the picture that I could find. And then we have the 8-inch and 175 version of this. Notice how, how many sandbags are on top of it. Again, very lightly armored, so uh, they would a lot of times put sandbags there for additional protection. Of course, the, you know, how, how can you have a thing without the duster? And by the way, if any of you have seen that new uh, stencil book on the M uh, M42, anybody seen that? Just over on the table. Yeah. Excellent book. I went through that last night, and just a ton of Vietnam pictures. Really, David uh, Doyle has done a really good job on that. The, 40, the 42 was designed as an air defense weapon, evolved out of the M19, and of course, by the time it got to Vietnam, it was not being used for air defense. Three battalions were sent over. They proved very, very effective in the ground support role on fire bases and also for convoy missions. 
uh, literally those 48 millimeters would you know, just clear a swath of jungle like a sick side. And there are any, any troops in the opening kept them on the shred. Uh, the problem was, of course, was lightly armored and the, the crew was pretty much exposed up there in the turret, so they had to be careful there. <coughs> and just another just nice general shot of the guy working on himself. Um, if you've ever held a clip of these things, they're not real light, but they're not also real heavy. I mean, you know, but uh, they would be fed with the four shot clip and drop it in, and then you start another one here. So, very effective weapon. And then the recovery vehicle M88. These are in short supply over there and constantly in demand. Uh, the Academy kit comes in various, various versions of it. It's not Academy. AFB club? AFB club. Yeah. 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 And it's a nice kit. Except for the damn guards for the headlines. Those things are the fragile things in the world. The plastic ones. The metal ones are very, very easy to work with, but they're, they're, they get in shape and they're easy. And again, look at the you know, look at the dirt buildup on this thing and how it happens. So if you're going to model Vietnam armor, uh, you, you need to be up on how you know your weathering process and your dust process. And here from being Gary, we were sent home, and you can see there's uh, just how dirty and filthy these vehicles would get. Bridge layer. These were not that common over there, but you, you, you could occasionally see them. Both the 48 and the 60 chassis were used. Here's the power pack being taken out, and I think this is a 60. I think. Okay. And this is the uh, 578 being used to carry our concentrator well. Interesting enough, I, I, you all know who Dick Honeycutt, Honeycutt was, don't you? Mm -hmm. Dick was a true gentleman. I, I, I sent him a letter one time, and you know, he, at that time he was the guru of American model, uh, armor uh, writing, and I said, Dick, could you help me out on a project? I mean, he sent me tons of stuff. Greatest guy in the world. Nice, uh, a, a white-haired older gentleman, just nicest guy in the world. And he gave me, every, every book that he sent out, he published, he sent me a copy free. I mean, you think how many books he came up with, except for this M26 book. He sent me a, an autographed copy for nothing and paid the postage and everything. Just a, a true gentleman. And one day, he, I get a letter from him. After he sent me you know, dozens, if not hundreds of pictures and helped me out, he says, Jim, I need some help. Uh, you have a picture in your Sheridan book of an early prototype Sheridan at Fort Knox. I can't find that picture. Could by chance I borrow it? I mean, just, just asking. And it's like, Dick, you get out of my house almost. You get out of my wife. Almost. Don't you dare. Don't you dare tell her that. You're in trouble, pal. Don't you dare repeat that, because I'll tell something to Michelle. And, but just, this was the type of guy he was. You know, he's asking very nicely, could you help me out? After all the help he's given me, it was like, hey, I've helped you out, could you help me? Nicest guy in the world. And I actually, when he, I am not quite, but I almost cried when I found out that he passed away. He's just, just a, a super gentleman. Just, you know, one of those classy people that you, you once in a while you come across here. Just a great guy. So that's my tribute to Dick Honeycutt. Just a superb gentleman. Gun trucks, yes. Uh, and if you have any interest in gun trucks, I suggest the gun truck books that are over at the one table. Uh, great vehicles. Again, the same thing happened with the French. They had to take the trucks out of line so they would lose the transportation capacity. But these, these would be... Uh, very effective in combo support. Of course, the problem was they also acted as lightning rod. The Viet Cong or the uh, North Vietnamese knew that these were the ones you had to knock out, so they would just key in on these guys. But I mean, they came up with so many innovations. This here we have a quad 50 there, and the markings on these things are unbelievable. I mean, those books on the gun trucks over there, fantastic. And you know, one gun truck might have the same, the same gun truck might have four or five sets of markings as the crews evolve. Here we have Led Zeppelin. This has got the armored uh, box on the back, uh, 50 caliber, 60 M60s. You know, it was, whatever these guys could come up with, they did. I mean, it just you talk about <laughs> you talk about truck drivers with attitudes. These guys were them. I mean, they they wanted to get out there and mix with the enemy. <laughs> I mean, hey, carry your own tank around with you. You know, and this is a very common modification. They just drop an M113 on the back, and it's like, okay. 
you know, <laughs> these guys, uh, they were nuts. And the, the Markies, oh God, they just, you, you could spend your entire life modeling armor, you know, armored gun trucks that never come with the same scheme twice. Did those, uh, that M113 under, did they have the tracks on no, the No, the tracks were taken off. Okay. It was just basically the hull. <coughs> okay, we'll get that one. And here's one with a uh, convoy duster with the 113 on the back. And Gaudi Martin, I mean, these guys had access to paint stuff, so they had free time. They, 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 you know, this vehicle was theirs. It was like, yeah, hey, like you get these 18, 19, 20 year old kids, it's like, this is their hot run. And then it'd be something small like the Outlaw. I don't know if this is the, I don't think this is referring to the Jane, the Jane uh, Russell movie. But, but look, look at the 250s on the back. I mean, that's a lot of firepower. <laughs> and then we had the MPs driving around in little Jeeps with a 50 caliber machine gun and getting the daylight shot out of them. <laughs> so this, you know, and of course at the time they had nothing better to, you know, they didn't have anything better to fight with. So imagine these guys on convoy say, hey, you're going to go out and, you know, this convoy through where there's, we know there's an ambush and you got a Jeep. Like, oh, really? Okay, thank you, boss. Jim, that vehicle is too light for that caliber gun, though, right? Pardon? That, that vehicle is too light. To oh, yeah. Light. I, I can't imagine how much that, uh, you know, holding it down with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Better roll that mud over. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting. You know, we, we're all interested in military history. And we were, I was judging a contest one time, and some guy was, he had done a little diorama. It was a nice little diorama. And he shows a guy holding the 50 caliber machine gun barrel in his hand like this, just kind of swabbing it out. He's got the arm up like that. It's like, the comment was, you obviously have never held a 50 caliber machine gun. <laughs> because that thing, you, unless you're Schwarzenegger, you're not just going to hold this up in the air and just swab it out. It's going to be like, oh. It's 102 pounds. Yeah, it's like, <coughs> you know, like I said, Arnold, you're not going to be doing that. Then we get the V100, which is a, an interesting vehicle. Yeah. <coughs> again, these MPs have too much time on our hands for the painting and stuff. But again, a lot of interesting marking on these. Uh, and armor. Look, I mean, look at the armor on this. You got the twin 30s, uh, the 50 on the one in the middle there. You got M60s mounted on them. I mean, these guys, they, they, gee, I think everybody in the crew had a gun, even the dog. <laughs> <laughs> but we were on, one night we were walking perimeter patrol, and we hear this like, and this like this small rumbling sound, nothing big. And we turned around, and here was one of the Air Force uh, B100 with the open parapet. And these guys had pulled up behind us, and I mean, they were quiet. I mean, it did surprise us that they got as close to us as they did before we even noticed them. So, an effective vehicle, great for convoy security. And here we have one that, the full line, a full set of markings on it. Uh, and then you get, in the front you have the, the stretchers in case you have to extract somebody. So, <laughs> neat vehicles. And there's, now we have some good kids of mine. This particular one was, uh, I was at the barracks next to where I was at at Tonsonet. These they had some army guys there, and they had inherited these vehicles from I want to say the 716th MP Battalion. It wasn't that unit, but they were they hadn't repainted their markings, so it was the old unit's markings with this new unit. And you had the, uh, the big uh, M113 uh, style uh, gun shield on top of the thing there. Now that guy must have had to stand up to fire that machine gun because. That's awful high up there. Yeah. Like, okay. Or you got, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, a huge basketball player up there just could reach up like that. But. And Air Force M113. And this is over at the being very ship town. I told this to a buddy of mine who, who he got all sorts of weapons. He had, he had a 50 caliber down in his bay, he had M60s, he had laws. And I thought about this, they said, let's go over and see about this. And it's like, why? I said, well, maybe you can bring it back. I said, no, we're not going to steal an Air Force F-113, man. You know, I draw the line of taking you there and getting us, uh, getting us in trouble. And here's some Air Force of the uh, V-100s. Uh, the open parapet there, and the neat camouflage scheme on it. And then a, a variation on the camouflage scheme. Notice you get the twin 50s and then the M60 in the background. And then 
And here's just one, a uh, little bit, another variation of the Gamma scheme, single M60. And these were used for base security by the Air Force. Aussies, Centurion Air. And uh, very effective over there. They took up the bazooka place because of the mud, you know, it was clogged with the mud and stuff. So these were very, very effective. The Aussies, the infantry, the infantry loved them. Recovered vehicle of the Centurion. Again, there's a small contingent of these of the support of the Aussie and the New Zealand guys over there. <coughs> Philippine Army M113, uh, used to protect uh, the Philippine <coughs> aid workers over there, or the yeah, aid for the reconstruction people. Um, as the war has evolved, we start to replace stuff with the armor, and the main tank that we gave them was the M41. They liked the M41. It was built to their stature, basically. For Americans, it was too small. For the South Vietnamese, it was just right. So uh, they really liked this vehicle. And this was used in their armored cavalry troops. Oftentimes, they would be held in fire bases and not go out on action. So uh, later on in 72, a lot of the bases that are under siege, these were destroyed by the North Vietnamese firing the anti-tank missiles. And of course, the Vietnamese got the V100s and they used for road security. And this was during the battle uh, up in, uh, around Quang Tri, and you see here some Vietnamese M113s and M577s. Uh, and then in the back, you see one Vietnamese <coughs> 113 with the, uh, I believe it's the core uh, badge on the side of it. Slim trucks, their version, with 20 millimeter cams on the back of them. <coughs> there they are, the twin twenties like that. I had a picture, it was interesting. Uh, I took over Tom's at one time. I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, man, let's see if I have it here. That's probably it. Yeah, okay. Let's go back. Ah, shit. Come on. <laughs> The entire side, it was a Vietnamese Air Force one, and the entire side had a long flaming eagle on the side of it. And it was kind of stylized. And this was the Vietnamese Air Force insignia, and they had it on the sides of 113s on their gun trucks. And um, by, the, by the way, the rule of the road in Vietnam was the bigger vehicle had the right of way. So uh, Mr. Uh, Army or Arvin Air Force guy there, uh, if you don't want to get run down, get out of the way of the Jeep behind you. And they were sitting in the M24s. Uh, here you see the, the kind of the weird, kind of greenish, uh, blackish green camouflage. Uh, and you get to see the brown and the greenish camouflage here. This particular vehicle may be the ones that you're going to see in the next couple of vehicles, next couple of shots. Uh, this is by Tonson Nook. This one is at Tonson Nook. And it may well be this this vehicle right here that I took when I was over there. Uh, first thing I saw when I drove off the base when they took us out of the base, and you know you're kind of paranoid the first day you land in Vietnam and they take you out of there. Everybody else goes out in the bus and bomb the screen or the screen wire to prevent the grenades being thrown in. They lowly listen and they get the bus with no screens whatsoever. It's like oh thanks guys. And we pull out the gate, and we rented a little Vietnamese village with like palm trees and stuff. It's like, oh my God, we get killed every the first day here. Well, they had these little Vietnamese areas that they would live in right by the base. And they'd come off the base and they'd live there. So there were their families there. We thought it was the jungle. Little did we know. Uh, but I, I, I'm scared to death. I look out, I see a tank. I see this M24. It's like, you know, this place might not be too bad after all. You know, Modelers don't have a, a, a bit of sense in their head. Anymore. And this is the same vehicle three months later, repainting. Same identical vehicle, okay? With that lime green and black camouflage scheme. These were supposedly the last or last enemy's tanks in action fighting against T-54s and T-59s. Now imagine going after one of those in an M-24. You thought the guys in Korea had it bad when they went against the T-34s? Imagine going against a T-54 T-59. Damn it. 
I apologize. Okay, here's one. Uh, just the roadside. It was destroyed on the side of the road. It's probably used as a, as a bunker now. And here we have some. Uh, oh, ferrets. What? Ferrets. What ferrets on this one? I are they ferrets? I don't think they're ferrets. Oh, uh, lynx. They look like dingoes, dingoes, but I think they're the. The fox is that the Canadian one? I think it's the Canadian version of dingoes. These these were all over the place, and most of them were derelict. You can see some of those earlier armored cars in the background, and the different style. You see the different style of turrets on top of them. <coughs> but again, uh, this stuff was by this point being used by the second, like the popular forces or around bases and stuff. Now I did come across a Vietnamese uh, junkyard, and here's an M48 or an M48 M8, and. In the junkyard, they had this right here. They had an M3 half track. Uh, here's one of those vehicles on the perimeter north of Saigon, of, of Hans and Hood. Just there's a whole line of these up and down the up and down the perimeter. None of them were functioning. In fact, this is what appears to be a like a Vickers machine gun, right there. It's a stovepipe. And I'm quite sure it fooled the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese because they had no idea that. You know, they had no spies around whatsoever. Yeah, right. And this white thing here, this is trash. So, okay, this is during the battle uh, in, the, in, the, in the spring of 1942. Or 42, yeah, 72. This is an F-41 up along the main highway coming south from Quad Tree, and it's a destroyed uh, M-41. And this is a Vietnamese picture of An Lang, which was about 30 miles from where I was stationed at. And at night, we would watch the arc light strikes come in, and uh, the whole sky would light up, and we would feel the ground shake. But what the North Vietnamese did, they could have taken An Lang if they had infantry support, but they go just rolling down the street in rows and rows of tanks. And the South Vietnamese are scared shitless. I mean, literally, there's these regional forces who are hold up and they see tanks coming at them and they didn't know what to do. So they had M79s. Not M79s. Lost. And all of a sudden one of them says, we're up on a second story. Let's take a shot at it. It hits a T-54 or T-59, knocks it out, and all along the street, just a cascade of these laws takes out a whole column. And you can see here a column of T-55s or T-54s or T-59s knocked out. And Anlock became one of the pivotal battles uh, which the North Vietnamese should have bypassed and come, they could have come right downtown to Nook. But they decided to dig in there and fight, fight for it and horrendous, horrendous losses. Most of the town was destroyed, but they, they suffered horrendous losses and then blunted their offensive down in the south. Here's one of the uh, T-54s or T-59s that was captured up in Quang Tree. Uh, I got inside, not this, well, I came back, I got inside this one. And in one of the two that I saw, they were there was a chain there to keep the driver in place. Damn it! Okay. And SU fifty seven capture or knocked out. There is a kid of this out, a, a, a resident kid of this out. DTR. Um, of the DTR-50 version. This was knocked, knocked out at the Battle of Lang Bay, and I actually got to see this thing in, 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 on, the, the, on the ground of the Joint Vietnamese, the Vietnamese Joint General Staff. So I take on an M48. Not a smart move. And this is the Chinese version, which is the T-50 or T-69 which had, a, a, I think, an 83-millimeter cannon in it. You can tell the turret's a little different. Uh, but again, the South Vietnamese with American Air Support really is a lot rally. This was at the end, you can see here, I, I believe this is Ann Lock right here. And this is a the Chinese uh, it Type 63. Type 63, yeah, the Chinese version. This was captured and taken uh, back to Australia by the Aussies. Well, it was captured, not captured by the Aussies, but they, they got hold of it and took it back to uh, Australia. That was a Bronco kid. Pardon? That was a Bronco kid. Yeah. 
And here's an overhead view of an American air base or an American armor area. And you can see here 113, you can see 48, you can have M88s. Um, what else is there? Just kind of, just kind of a neat aerial view there. And here's a line of 48s. I think the rest of the stuff is just basically. I'm not sure we're gonna go here. Where we gonna go? Uh, it's basically just a line of the stuff getting ready to go back into Tata 68. Cool picture of this 113. Uh, probably politically not politically correct now. It's a rebel flag, <laughs> but uh, you know, it was Vietnam. Who cares? And Stoopy. I'm sure Charles Schultz probably did not like when he saw something of this, liking having Snoopy views on the vehicle there. Another 113. Just you see the name on the front, the cab, uh, cab flag, the star, the uh, screen hanging down from the side. And we use these as light tanks. And again, the same unit for different marking on the front of the. Um, Hull plate. And just in, in action in the field. Now, the, the, the M113 was used, I mean, a, a huge variety of markings here. Um, you can see the, the, the reddish, I'm not sure quite what this is right here. See that right there. <coughs> And this is a camouflage one. I don't think this is an Air Force one. And I think that's the last one. Yep, that's the last one. So, does anybody have any questions or comments or, you know, feel free to ask. Well, I was, uh, I was in Vietnam, 172, same time. Same time, where were you at? I was a Marine on the Coral Sea. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you were a sailor on the Yeah, there, there's something wrong with this with this thing here. Yeah. Why weren't you there? Why was I on the Coral? Because I get seasick, so that's why I'm better off there. <laughs> but uh, uh, we actually, you know, it was an A6 squadron, and we actually. Uh,